Hello, I will just wait another minute to make sure everybody is everybody's good to go. And there we are. All right. Well, I think we're ready. We got a good, a good showing already. So let's kick it off, Alex. If you are ready. Great. Um, excellent. Well, welcome all to uh, the first of four Wednesday webinars um, on the Every Student Succeeds Act, uh, or ESSA, brought to you by Excel and Ed. Um, we're thrilled so many of you could join us today, and um, we, we're particularly thankful for the, the questions that you sent in um, when, you, when you signed up. It's, it's been a huge help to, to see what's of interest to folks and to what's, um, what your questions are. Um, we noted a lot of them, showing how much people already know, a lot of them were super specific. We will, read, we will address a number of the questions today, but we'll address all of the questions over the coming months excuse me, over the coming weeks. Um, and because, because today um, is, is really going to be about the big themes of ESSA. I think um, a lot of us have gone diving into the details of, of the new law, and it's important to take a step back for a second and really get, the, get a big picture about what this means for you and, and for your state. Um, let me take a moment to introduce myself. I'm Claire Voorhees. I'm the Director of K-12 Reform here at the Foundation for Excellence in Education. And um, uh, the 10 second version of my bio is I started as a fourth grade teacher. Um, I worked in federal policy at the White House and the U.S. Department of Education and, uh, and I was also a lawyer. So I'm hoping that with that varied background I have uh, I can at least do attempt to help you guys understand this uh, massive new federal law and, and the uh, challenges and opportunities it presents. Um, before introducing my esteemed colleague down in Tallahassee, a um, couple minutes of housekeeping. Um, one is that you are all automatically muted, which means you should feel free to eat that sandwich you've been wanting to eat. Um, you, uh, we, we can't hear you or see you. Um, I will try to refrain from eating a sandwich during uh, the next 45 minutes to an hour. Um, also, please send questions. You already sent in some questions, but as we go, you can send them either through the chat or through the special question area. Um, we find that in talking about this new law, it helps tremendously to make it interactive. So please send them in and we'll, we'll handle them as they come. Um, now down to uh, Alex Kelly, our VP for Advocacy down in Tallahassee. Thank you, Claire. Uh, again, I'm Alex Kelly, uh, VP of Advocacy for the Foundation for Excellence in Education. Um, just, uh, again, a little bit about myself as well. Uh, have worked um, uh, primarily in Florida over the years, but in recent years also have done uh, advocacy, different types of governmental relations work in some of the other Gulf area states as well. Uh, so really happy that everyone could be here today, and uh, hopefully this is informative and, and tees up uh, a good discussion for you and all of your different state partners. Um, so I'm going to start uh, really at the surface, uh, and then uh, a little bit later Claire will dive a little bit deeper into the policy and the timeline, but I'm really going to kind of start at the surface and focus on uh, early planning, what to do, uh, what we'd recommend doing in states, um, and then early good questions to ask, and then uh, we'll come back later to finishing with just really what can we do now, what resources are, are out there right now to, to be helpful. Um, so thinking about the big themes of ESSA, uh, there's a number of different ways uh, that you could look at uh, this law, how it impacts your state, uh, different policies. But the theme that we've chosen, the, the lens that we're going to look through everything with is opportunity. Um, we think that that's the best messaging, that's the best approach. Uh, as uh, we have to go out and explain uh, the policy to other state partners or uh, grassroots stakeholders, lawmakers, uh, and so forth. Uh, and we say opportunity because uh, as you look at the slide, there's some very real examples. States are going to have freedom to develop their own goals for student proficiency, graduation, English proficiency. Uh, states 
must choose an additional indicator of school quality or student success uh, for their accountability formulas. But there's tremendous freedom for the states in doing so. So uh, there's a requirement, but there's a lot of freedom in how to meet that requirement. Uh, states are going to have to, uh, will select their own school supports and interventions. It's a much less prescriptive uh, process. States will have tremendous freedom around things like school turnaround, uh, which is, as I think many of us know, it's one of the most difficult tasks uh, in, in education reform. And another great example, states will be able to uh, experiment with student-centered funding uh, under a weighted student uh, funding pilot. Uh, and it's an opportunity to advance uh, student-centered funding reforms uh, and create proof points um, that all states are going to need. Uh, for future reauthorizations of the law, um, and potentially uh, for those who might take this direction of school choice, uh, potentially a huge support for school choice innovations. So uh, the topic, though, and, and, and we touch on this in the slide, particularly uh, uh, with slide three, is the topic that's going to be probably foremost in most states, uh, get most of the headlines, uh, is going to be assessment. Uh, and it's important to recognize a couple things right off the top when it comes to ESSA and assessments. Um, number one, assessments are going to remain. They're, uh, they're here to stay. Um, but number two, uh, like we noticed, we, uh, we mentioned flexibility. Number two, states are going to have tremendous authority to innovate and really ask some fundamental questions, uh, particularly if you look at, at bullet number three, ask some fundamental questions about how do we test? Uh, how do we make sure that testing benefits students, parents, teachers, classrooms? Um, and so states are going to have an opportunity to really think through the value add of testing and use that, use that as a tool um, to really help uh, communities, uh, uh, school districts, others understand um, uh, the value of testing. Um, and, and certainly testing and accountability in, in general are going to create challenges in, in the realm of public debate uh, because to one degree or another, every, every state is going to have some transitioning uh, to do uh, in law or administrative rule. Um, so it's, it's not something that any state's going to be immune from, even if you're just going through a, a simple transition process. And that is what's going to happen for, for some states. Um, but let, let's face it, most of us do what we do because uh, these sorts of policy questions inherently bring to the table um, uh, groups who oppose the policy, support the policy, and others who, who want to improve it. So. We know that just having the public discourse on the transition alone is going to bring uh, other players into the discussion. So uh, thinking that through and thinking through the challenges, we still, we still uh, with Excel and Ed, come back to the focus of let's have the theme of opportunity. Let's embrace that theme of opportunity, even though we know there's going to be challenges around uh, assessments and other issues. And, and so perhaps, um, Perhaps as a state, you're considering uh, a fewer better test policy. Perhaps you're considering a digital learning policy, competency-based learning, something innovative uh, with teaching, an early literacy policy. Uh, use ESSA, take advantage of it, to see if your ideas for innovation uh, fit within ESSA. Use it as your vehicle uh, to advocate. Um, and, and that's we think maybe the best approach to take as you design your state plan and you work with coalition partners. And before I, I turn it back to Claire, you, you know, in addition to what's on the first slide, I think one essential thing that everyone's going to need to do as we develop plans uh, and, and, and processes for how we're going to go about implementing ESSA is think through a basic question uh, that all of our coalition partners might ask. Um, or, or folks who you want to have in your coalition might ask, which is basically why, why should they care? Why, why should I care? We, um, in fact, a, 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 an interesting uh, side note, um, Claire and I and some other members of our team got to present on uh, this topic at a, at a small conference recently. And the first question that we got about ESSA was, why should I care? And it, it surprised us, but we realized it was an important question to have answered. So, in thinking through the work that all of you are going to do in your states, um, uh, transitioning accountability, the different innovations that are wrapped into the law, thinking through that question up front about why business leaders, why teachers, why parents should care about the law, um, and, and thinking that through and having those answers ready is going to be helpful in your coalition building um, that we'll touch on later. And in, in thinking through what some of those answers might be, um, you know, for business leaders it might be as simple as saying, 
the, the full array of issues in ESSA directly impact the readiness of, of students to have a career. Uh, for teachers, it might be uh, that this is an opportunity to focus on the kinds of information, data points, uh, and tools that we actually need in classrooms. So this is an opportunity to, to do some refocusing, um, and, 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 and so we should take advantage of that. Uh, for parents, um, there are many very student-centered themes in ESSA. So let's ensure that systems uh, that we create or transition and the innovations that we create are designed around students. And uh, for civil rights advocates, um, uh, this is an opportunity to ensure that we drive home the message that all students can learn. So uh, there's important themes to embrace here. And as we build coalitions and we build consensus around uh, what we're going to do in each individual state, thinking through these questions are going to be very, very helpful. Um, with that said, I'm going to turn it back to Claire now, who is going to talk through uh, the timeline and, and a, a deeper look at uh, some of the transition of what actually has happened at federal policy. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Alex. Um, yes, I'm, I'm lucky me. I get to dive into this, the weeds of this thousand-page law. Um, and the, the slide you're looking at now is really our attempt to break down that thousand-page law into a single page, a single slide. Um, and it, it also helps answer this, a really preliminary question, which is how is this law, how is ESSA different from the No Child Left Behind Act, or NCLB, which was the prior reauthorization of this uh, big federal law? Um, and th this slide does a lot of things, but one of the things it does is um, it, it correct the common misconception about this law. A lot of folks in uh, the, the media and other policymakers have said that this, this law passes all authority back to the states. And the truth is um, that that's not completely accurate. The law does return a ton of power to the states, as, as you'll see. But the careful legislative compromise that was struck between Democrats and Republicans on Capitol Hill really does preserve some um, very important provisions around um, accountability and equity, while also giving states a tremendous amount of freedom. So it's, a, it's really a careful balance between those two, um, and not accurate to say that, state, that it's open season for states by any means. Um, so, but um, you know, let's, start, let's start, though, on this left column. And I am going to walk through in a lot of detail um, uh, the, the concepts in, in, uh, laid out here. And please do, if there's something that doesn't make sense or something you want more information on, please do throw a, uh, uh, throw a question our way. Um, starting at the, the, the top of the eliminated column um, is about standards. Um, and the, there's a really interesting shift in this law around the federal role in standards. And the change is actually pretty subtle but important. Um, since 2001, for you know, um, almost 20 years, federal law has prohibited the federal government from requiring states to have their standards approved or from really getting it, um, too involved in standards um, review and approval. But what's changed under ESSA is that the uh, federal government may no longer even incent states to adopt a particular set of standards. As you might imagine, this change was in response to the federal government's efforts under Race to the Top or uh, under the waivers of No Child Left Behind to incent states to adopt the Common Core standards. So now, under, current, under this law, in addition to not having to um, submit your standards for review, um, you, uh, this, the federal government cannot even give you any sort of incentive related to standards. Um, you know, in, in addition, jumping to the, um, continuing on the issue of standards, but jumping to the new column, you, you'll note that the, the change here, the substantive change that has occurred around standards is that state standards must be aligned to credit-bearing courses or relevant career and technical education standards. That's just a subtle change, um, but we're unlikely to see any sort of massive changes related to standards um, under this new law states will most likely uh, uh, keep in place what they have today. Um, next, next topic, back to the eliminated column. Um, 
uh, is adequate yearly progress or AYP. Um, this is a term of art or for many maybe a term of horror used under uh, No Child Left Behind. Um, as you may recall under, no, under NCLB um, all subgroups, all, all schools and all subgroups within every school had to make adequate yearly progress toward 100 percent proficiency um, by 2014. Um, this was a federally required goal and if any subgroup in any school missed that goal in a given year, the school was labeled as failing. It's one of the many provisions that um, quickly became unworkable under No Child Left Behind. ESSA does away with adequate yearly progress and it does away with any sort of federal goal setting. It will now be up to states to set their own goals for student performance. Um, they will also, states will also have freedom to set the consequences for a school that misses uh, its goals or for a subgroup that misses its goals. Um, school improvement grants staying in that eliminated column. Um, under No Child Left Behind, this is an important change under the new law. Under No Child Left Behind, and in fact also under the um, U.S. stimulus bill, the federal government awarded money to states to turn around their lowest performing schools. Um, in accepting that money, states had to agree to adopt and implement uh, one of four pretty prescribed models for turning around schools. Under ESSA, states will still get money from the federal government to turn around low-performing schools. In fact, they can use more of their Title I money to do it. Um, but it will be completely up to states um, and districts and schools to decide what those interventions look like. The federal government no longer has anything to say on interventions. Uh, a really important change. And I should mention here that you know this will be you know a great, again as Alex pointed out, a great opportunity for states, a great challenge as well. Um, turning around low performing schools uh, or increasing the number of high performing uh, seats in a low performing district is an incredibly challenging thing to do where um, we encourage states to start thinking about it now and, and, and we do look forward to working with states to try to do that. It's a big uh, we think a big piece of uh, a high need for states um, over the coming months and years. Um, on to teachers. Um, the last two items in the eliminated columns. Um, the uh, ESSA eliminates two key provisions related to, to teachers. Um, the first are, some of you may be familiar with the highly qualified teachers requirements. This was under No Child Left Behind. States had to ensure um, that by 2014 also they had all of their teachers meeting certain requirements for preparation and education. Um, it was a largely unworkable and unpopular provision. This, um, this law completely does away with those requirements. That was one of the questions we received actually. There are no requirements related um, to the high quali uh, highly qualified teachers requirement. Um, the other provision that it, uh, this law does it away with um, were the teacher evaluations. Now, now this is a, a little more complex because teacher evaluations weren't required by No Child Left Behind. They were required by the department for states seeking waivers. Um, most of your states probably had waivers and they were therefore were required to implement teacher evaluation systems. Those um, are no longer required. Um, under ESSA, but we should say from an advocacy perspective and a reform perspective, we certainly um, hope that states continue to pursue and refine their uh, teacher evaluation systems and that they be based on student, um, student achievement, at least in part, but uh, that's no longer federally required. It's really an area that the federal government is going to be really hands off for the foreseeable future. Uh, moving on, still on this uh, monster of a slide, um, uh, is moving on to the survived column. This is where we really get in the sense that um, you know, there were plenty of things, there's plenty of freedom for states, but some of the basic tenets of accountability and reform were preserved in this law. Um, related to assessments. Um, the law, as Alex mentioned, 
still requires the same annual testing requirements that have existed under No Child Left Behind. States still must annually test students in reading and math in grades three through eight at once in high school. Still have to test in each grade span in science. Um, and states also have to continue to participate in NAEP, or uh, the nation's report card, as it's known. Um, yeah, that's an important requirement. Um, um, as many of you know, um, without, in, in states where results aren't comparable across states, the NAEP allows us to compare proficiency levels to, to make sure that states are keeping that bar, bar high and, that, um, and, and providing an equal challenge, an equal opportunity uh, to each of their students. So that's um, really a key provision that survived. Um, as Alex noted before, I should mention, um, and, and we'll get to that in the next column here, but while annual testing is preserved, there are a ton of opportunities to innovate and get smarter about testing. But those basic kind of that skeleton, that basic testing requirement is still, is still there, but we'll talk about different ways that states can innovate around it. Um, Another uh, important piece that provide that survived and actually has grown is um, reporting. Um, uh, states and districts will still have to report disaggregated data, just like under No Child Left Behind, disaggregated by subgroup. Um, in fact, the reporting requirements under ESSA are um, even more significant with some interesting new data, um, uh, like such as per pupil expenditure. Um, uh, by source. There's going to be some interesting even additional data that um, state and districts will have to report. Um, another important piece um, are some the federal accounting rules that, that many of you are familiar with and, and in fact asked about in the questions. Um, ESSA preserves the supplement not supplant requirement. Um, that is, um, so it remains in law. Congress did attempt to give some states some more freedom about how it, how they can comply with that law, um, but it remain it'll be up to the department in regulation to figure out um, exactly how much freedom states will have to comply with that requirement. You know, m moving to the the final column here, the new column, and this is um, touching back to Alex's theme of opportunities. This is really where we see. Um, some, you know, a, a ton of new opportunities that, that state, um, that can support state-led reforms and initiatives. These are ones that we've partnered with a lot of you on in the past and, and some new ones we hope to partner with you all on in the future. Um, we feel generally with ESSA there's been so much focus on uh, what's required, how, how states can figure out new accountability requirements, and we are, we are really encouraging states to and focus on that because it's so important, but to not forget about the new opportunities um, in, in the law. And that's something we'll focus on in our final webinar, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, at the end of May. We wanted to touch on a few of them today just to give you a, a, a preview of coming attractions. Um, the, the first opportunities around, new opportunities around assessments. Um, as I mentioned previously, um, couple, a number of new opportunities that even though those annual tests are still required um, and still incredibly important, there's some interesting ways to innovate around that. For example, um, the SSA creates uh, a competitive grant program for states to compete for funding for assessment audits. So if your state is one of those states that has a ton of um, low, low quality, um, or redundant tests at the local or school level. This allows you to apply for federal money up to, in fact, $1.5 million um, to go through and clean out that system, identify the tests that are working for students and the ones that aren't, and to get rid of the ones that aren't. Um, really an important step for some states. Um, another huge opportunity around assessments is the innovative assessment pilot. Um, the, the law allows the secretary, the, the idea here was to give states an outlet. We know um, that um, 
we, we still need a annual testing for a ton of accountability and equity reasons. But we wanted um, a path forward from some states that are ready to kind of lean in and, and change the way that they test and learn, uh, and, excuse me, test and teach kids. Um, so this allows the Secretary of Education to establish a pilot for up to seven states or a consortia of states to experiment with innovative forms of uh, assessing and accountability. Um, we think this represents a huge opportunity for states, for a state that's ready to move towards competency-based education, um, to, to do that transition with some um, federal support and with some federal guardrails. Certainly not for every state, because it's a huge list. It's something that needs to happen statewide um, eventually. So it might not be for every state, but it's, it's going to be a great opportunity for certain states. Uh, and the, another important shift to note um, is around um, accountability for English learners. Um, this is a question um, that comes up a ton, because it's a little bit of a subtle shift in the law, but it, it could have um, will likely have huge consequences for states. Um, and this is that um, states for a long time have been held responsible for the, accountable for the performance of English learners. But they were held under Title III, which is a much smaller program in the law, and it simply got less attention. It didn't have to be part of your main state accountability system. Um, this law, ESSA, takes um, accountability for English learners and moves it right into Title I. So, which is your main accountability system that you're familiar with. Um, so now one of the main changes in the law is that states are going to have to um, look at the, um, um, how well the progress of in achieving English proficiency among English learners and incorporate that into their overall school grading or school accountability system. So this is a huge um, change for states in terms of the the attention that these English learners might get. And um, you know, it'll be interesting to see how states um, handle this. It's because it's a it's a, a new requirement for states and, and we're, we're kind of not sure what it's going to look like, um, but a, but an important change um, above all. A uh, couple more opportunities um, that, that, that really should be top of mind going into the next, uh, and during, into the transition to this new law. Um, the first is something known as uh, direct student services, or an optional set-aside. So this, this part of the law allows a state to opt, only if they choose, to set aside 3% of their Title I dollars to the, to the state to run a competitive grant program um, to promote choice-related activities in high-needs districts. So in other words, it's a great opportunity for an interested state to, um, to kind of give a carrot to districts to encourage them to pursue course access or um, provide transportation for public school choice. Some really opportunity, uh, interesting opportunities for the state here. Um, to give you a sense of the range of money that 3% is, um, which I think is important for people, a state like Wyoming could set aside around a uh, around million dollars. A state like California could set aside about $54 million. Um, so if you put your state in the middle of where it ends up in that scale, you'll have a sense of what 3% of Title I is for you. Um, another important opportunity, um, weighted student funding pilot. Um, ESSA authorizes secretary um, to enter into three-year agreements for up to 50 districts across the country to experiment with weighted student funding and to use their federal dollars on top of state and local dollars to do that. Um, we think um, you know, weighted student funding is, is a really important piece of the puzzle, and we hope a lot of states and districts are looking to move in that direction. Um, uh, promotes equity, promotes portability, um, important first step and opportunity for, for, the, for interested districts. Um, and finally, in the new category, um, is a, a, a large block grant um, known as the Student Support and Academic Enrichment Block Grant. It rolls off the tongue. We just call it the block grant. Um, for shorthand, um, this is so Congress took in part of its compromise. Congress took about 50 or so smallish programs and combine them into one 
huge block grant and gave states and districts a lot more freedom of how to distribute that money. Um, it's unclear how big it'll be. It was authorized at $1.6 billion, um, and in fact, a lot in Congress are calling for it to, to be that large, um, but the programs that were rolled up into it were only about $400 million. So it'll be somewhere in that range, which is obviously a big one, um, a, a large range, but um, still a lot of money that states will be able to shift and instead of into specific programs um, as before, they can use to pursue a state priority, such as does the state want to double down on digital learning? Do they want to push AP or industry certifications? This will be federal money that a state can direct um, how it sees, sees fit. That is um, kind of all I got on this, this this monster of a slide. Are there any particular questions? Sam, I'm turning to our you might director of operations <laughs> over here. Um, you might have uh, answered this already, but highly qualified okay. teachers uh, requirement cut, is there any other national expectation for teacher quality left in the bill? Um, national expectation? Um, no, n yes and no. There's no... Um, real requirement that, that teachers meet any sort of um, federal standard. I will say that there, um, uh, there's still money in the bill. There are two answers. There is money in Title II in the bill, in the law, to support a lot of teacher quality efforts. That is still there. The other interesting thing that is in the bill is an interesting reporting requirement, which is that um, states and districts are now going to have to report um, the uh, their teacher qualifications, like how experienced they are, and disaggregate that by low-income and high-income schools. So it could be an interesting equity lever for advocates because you'll be able to see, we all know that just because the teacher is more experienced doesn't mean they're necessarily better, but will be really good data on um, where districts and um, schools are distributing their newer teachers or their um, teachers who are working out of area. So. No requirements, but a, a good transparency piece that can help states get at that, help advocates get at that. Okay. The second question sure. was, um, how will the U.S. Department of Ed ultimately regulate uh, the supplement, not supplant requirement? Um, a great, oh, great question on supplement, not supplant, and it's a great question because I can't answer it um, because it's unanswerable at this point. Um, this uh, supplement, not supplant, as I, as I mentioned, um, Congress quite uh, quite clearly in the legislation tried to give state, preserve the requirement, but tried to give states some additional flexibility of how they comply with that requirement, states and districts. Um, however, um, the U.S. Department of Education appears to be taking a different tact with that and it's in its rulemaking um, during negotiated rulemaking and we'll um, I'll actually flip to that slide right now since we're moving that direction. During the department's initial negotiated rulemaking, the department put out proposed rules for supplement not to plan that were rather uh, aggressive. Um, got a lot of pushback from the Hill, but most from Capitol Hill, but most relevant um, in negotiated rulemaking, they did not reach agreement on that topic. That means that it will be up to the department to submit um, and propose a new regulation around supplement not the plan that we'll all have an opportunity to comment upon in the coming months. So it's a question that's not answered yet and will be an interesting one to see during this uh, rulemaking process in the coming months. Do you want to do one more? Question? I think we can we'll move to the timeline if we have um, other ones come in. Um, great, so on, on to the timeline and this is a question, um, you know, this is an attempt to address a ton of the questions that, that we get about what the actual rollout of this law is, is going to look like. Um, this timeline, I, I'll walk through it from a couple different perspectives, but just to give you a, a sense of what we've done here is we've organized it by school year. Um, I don't know if as education advocates you think about it that way, um, but we've organized it by school year. Um, with, of course, the, um, and if you're an advocate and you organize yourself by um, sessions, state sessions, those probably happen in the middle here. Um, but um, I think the, the overarching point here, um, well, there, there are many of them, but one important point is that 
Um, if you like Congress or don't like what Congress did with this bill, the one thing that they did rather thoughtfully was they gave states a full 18 months to implement this law. Um, so th there's, of course, a ton of work to do, but there's also some time to be thoughtful. Um, but, but let's look at this first in terms of what states are going to have to do over the next 18 months. Um, we are, as you, as you know, we are ending at closing out the 2015-16 school year right now. Um, may, most states, most states that you all are in, their accountability systems, at least from a federal perspective, are currently governed by um, ESEA or NCLB waivers. Um, that's, that's what's governing what you're doing right now. Those waivers expire on August 1st of this year. Um, that means heading into the 2016-17 school year, um, there will be your waiver is null and void, and this is then the 16-17 school year becomes a quite really quite odd transition year because the, the federal requirements are pretty minimal. States must continue to test; they must continue to report the results, um, but there are no federal requirements related to identifying new schools um, or running your accountability system, of course, or, or making accountability determinations that year. We as, as advocates recommend that states continue to make the same um, decisions uh, under their existing accountability system, but there will be no federal requirement that they do so. Um, the new, your new accountability system in your state will take effect the 2017-18 school year. That means during, this, during next year's transition year, towards the end of the year, states are going to be developing their new plans and submitting them um, for approval to the department, their new accountability plans. That means, though, although there is the 18-month timeline, states should be thinking already and planning for that process. So departing for a second and moving toward and, and, and thinking about the federal perspective. So now we know what states are going to be have to doing. We get a lot of questions on when is guidance going to come out? When are we going to know what the heck the department is doing? Um, we, can, we can do our best to answer that. Um, the basics are, are that we all know, you know, we know yes, ESSA passed in December and that the department is off and running in rulemaking. Um, and we know the department's job is to, take, is to write more detailed rules and to make sense of the law that Congress passed. Um, you know, under ESSA, this, this process is a little more complex um, because um, on the one hand, Congress placed a lot of limits on what the department could do in rulemaking. Um, and on the other hand, Congress wrote a law that's pretty ambiguous um, and, and left a lot of gaps for the department to fill in. So it's really um, uh, will be an interesting process to watch over the coming over the coming months. Um, you know, an example of this is that Congress said that um, the department could not quote prescribe goals or the weights of indicators that you use in your accountability system. Well, what does prescribe? I mean, I, I, I hate to be a lawyer about it, but what does prescribe mean? Can they, I know they can't tell states what their goals are, can the department set parameters around what those goals should be or what those weights of indicators should be? And that's what there's going to be a real push-pull around that as the department tries to figure out what, what the appropriate role is and, and how far they can push the limits on that. Um, so this complex process of rulemaking is already underway. Um, to give you context, when they, off, when they regulated around the No Child Left Behind Act, that took three, four, five years. Um, so obviously this administration, the Obama administration, is not going to be responsible for doing all of the rulemaking. Um, what they're going to do is they're going to identify the top priorities of their administration. Um, our understanding is it's going to be around accountability and assessments, and they're going to just pick those pieces and try to regulate on them as quickly as possible and complete those regulations by the end of the administration. In order for that to happen um, and to comply with all the legal processes around rulemaking and public comment, we're going to likely have to see some initial drafts of the regulations very soon. 
So in the next month or so, we'll probably see the department's proposal for rules around accountability. We'll then have this summer is when um, there will be an opportunity for the public to comment on them. You know, some, some key points, um, the timeline, a, a lot to digest, and some key points based on you know, what the state should be doing and what the, the federal government will be doing. One key point, this is an incredibly complex and uncertain transition for a few reasons. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of, as you know better than we do, um, states are continuing to transition to new assessments um, and trying to incorporate those results into accountability systems. Um, they are unwinding their waivers, um, and they are all at the same time trying to design new ESSA compliant um, or adjusting, uh, revising their systems so they to bring them in compliance. There's a lot going on. Um, adding to the uncertainty is what's um, written in red here. If we go back to the federal timeline, they will be um, the Obama administration um, will be doing it, will be finalizing many of its most important regulations before it leaves office. However, a new president and a new secretary of education will be the one truly implementing this law. They'll be the ones um, asking for the accountability plans, the ones um, approving or asking states to, to change those accountability plans. And I don't need to tell anybody um, what, what an uncertain territory um, the new president is. It's, it's hard to really, uh, one of the questions that came in is what, what, um, what impact will a new president have? Um, really, it, it, who knows? Uh, the new president, they could in theory pull the regulations and start over again. Um, that's unlikely to happen, um, but certainly how strict or how open a department is um, uh, to, to reform will have huge implications um, for, for what kinds of plans from states get, um, get approved or how they interpret the law moving forward. So really you can't understate how significant a, a change in administration could be. Um, Final point, um, a, a, a couple, actually a couple more points. One is, given this uncertainty and, and given that we need to wait to see what the department says, at least in its initial rulemaking, uh, we don't think states should rush the transition. What we mean by that is states should rush to figure out what is it, they should rush to understand the law. They should rush to figure out what it is they want to see in their accountability system, what the goals are. Um, how, how, how it, they want it to be balanced, what, what indicators they want to be in it, and what consequences for schools. We don't recommend that any states pass any new laws right away um, until they've seen the regulations. Um, some states have al already, um, but we really want, um, really think it doesn't make a lot of sense for every time for a state to open up its accountability system and then have to change it again if it finds out that it doesn't comply with the department's regulations. So that's, that's our main recommendation. And the final one from this slide is that states should absolutely, states and everyone on this phone should be involved in the rulemaking process. It is supposed to be a public process. We've, uh, and uh, the most important participants are folks like you who are on the ground in states um, and know how these rules would affect you and, and, and your constituents in education. Um, so as, as I said, most likely this summer there'll be an opportunity to, to comment on the rules. So as soon as they come out, you should rely on groups like ours to translate um, and to, to make sense of them. And, um, and then you need to help us look at the areas where they could be strengthened or maybe areas where they need to be a little broader because they would tie states' hands. So we'll, we'll, we'll partner with all of you on that, but it's really important that um, states, the ones that will be truly impacted, you're the voices that are the most important in the process, and we're happy to help. Any any questions on that one, Sam? One quick question. Sure. Do state boards need to approve anything related to the state plans that will be submitted? Um, most likely, yes. State boards, that's a little bit of a hard question to answer because it depends on your state um, and, and how education governance is set up in your state, but um, of, of what the 
uh, what the legislature's role versus the state education agency versus the state board. That's going to be state specific question. Um, one, one place to look for a hint of that is however your state um, implemented its new system if you applied for an ESEA waiver um, about four or five years ago. Whatever that process looked like in terms of stakeholder engagement, in terms of who needed to approve what. Um, for example, some states had to pass new laws, some just needed new regulations, and some needed just a, um, a state board to approve it. Um, that'll be a good uh, telling indication of what will have to happen this time. Um, so it's a state-specific question both in terms of governance um, but also in terms of how much your state will have to change its accountability system to comply with ESSA. And for some states, that's going to be quite a bit. And for some states, it will be not very much. Um, for some states, we'll want to see a whole overhaul. And some states, just some, some changes around the edges to bring it in compliance. Um, so happy to help you guys think through that. But it's really a, a state-specific question. Good? Yeah. Excellent. All right. Um, we, we made this next slide because um, we get so many questions about grants. So sort of these are the um, uh, less sexy part of the law, but really have probably the most impact on, on a lot of lives in, in state education reform. Um, and as with most things with this law, um, there's no totally simple answer to when grants and other opportunities will become available. Um, but this slide helps, um, hopes to be able to walk through that a little bit and give the best, the, the clearest possible answer. Um, starting with competitive grant programs. There, any new competitive grant program under ESSA is going to begin in October 2016. So in effect, for fiscal year 2017. Um, that means that, for example, new, um, uh, new audit, uh, if, if a new audit opportunities for states might be available then. Um, um, the complex part of this question is, is uh, about competitive grants is it depends when the grant starts. So, because there's some, for example, under the charter school program that a lot of you may, states may participate in, a new version of the charter school program will start on t at October 2016. However, there'll be some um, multiple year grants that started earlier that will continue under old rules, overlapping with the ones that start under new rules. So any grant that starts kind of after 20, October 2016 will be subject to the new rules, although there might be still some existing ones that were subject to the old rules. As I said, nothing, nothing is simple with, with ESSA. Um, formula grants, um, uh, similarly, um, so new formula grants or new ESSA versions of existing formula grants will become available in the 17-18 school year. So just when your new accountability is coming online, a new accountability system, that's when these new grants will be available. So as an example, um, Title I, of course, will, will continue to go out every year, but the new rules, for example, new supplement not the plant requirements under Title I, those will kick off 2017, 2018. Um, the new block grant funds that I mentioned, um, those will be available um, likely the 17, 18 school year as well. Um, of course, the amount will depend on how much Congress decides to um, appropriate for it. Um, Last couple points on opportunities. We think, um, uh, I should mention, the large competitive grants for assessment audits won't be available until next year. But there are, for, for really interested states, there are some, there will be some funding of, for audits available in smaller amounts this summer under an existing grant. So let us know if you're interested, we can help you um, think through that. It could be an easy way to get your state moving on the audit right away for the right state. The direct student services, optional set aside, um, and the innovative assessment pilot we um, proceed will both be, start to be available most likely in 2017-18 school year. Um, they're different though because the optional set aside for direct student services, that's something that will happen automatically. Um, because it's in the law, you, um, it will automatically be an option starting the 2017-18 school year. 
In contrast, the innovative assessment pilot, that's something that it's up to the secretary to decide to do. So we understand that it's a priority of the Obama administration. They're going to be regulating, trying to set up a process for it, but it will really be up to the next secretary um, and next president whether it's something that actually uh, comes to fruition. We imagine it would continue, but that's just a bit more of a question mark. Um, great. Any additional questions on 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 timeline, Sam? Great. Um, well, let me pass it back to um, to Tallahassee and Alex to to round us out for uh, with all this information. What the heck do they do with it, Alex? Thank you, Claire. Um, yes, thinking about what is going to happen in 2016, what what you want to have happen in 2016 as you get ready for, um, you know, probably a legislative lift or perhaps as the question was asked, perhaps a rulemaking lift or both. In 2017, uh, I want to just reinforce the point first that, that Claire noted that um, first, what not to do. You know, we we would generally not recommend. Uh, you know, redesigning your whole accountability system this year. You can certainly get a get a jump start on certain pieces of it, and most importantly, I would say the planning. Uh, get a jump start on the planning and coalition building, as we mentioned in the slide. Get a jump start on that, and and get uh, goals and uh, plans together. Establish your priorities for um, how narrowly or broadly that you and coalition partners want to work on that. Um, and then build support for those goals uh, and priorities. Certainly, there's there's something to be said for for getting a, a jump start on your um, on redesigning your accountability system. But just recognize that because of the different rulemaking processes that Claire outlined, there's a likelihood that even if you did a lot of that work in 2016, you'd have to come back probably and fix and retool some things in 2017. So, but right now, plan, develop goals and priorities and then build support for those goals and priorities. For example, uh, looking at the, at the third bullet under number two here, uh, what, what would the state want to have uh, in, what, what would your state want to have in its turnaround toolbox? Would you want to have an achievement school district policy, uh, a policy regarding high performing charters, uh, something regarding public school choice, uh, or uh, the uh, distribution of, of effective teachers, a couple things that Claire mentioned earlier, uh, perhaps something of digital learning. So thinking through those questions and then saying, okay, well, if we're going to take on something regarding digital learning, do we have the right coalition partners for that task? Do we need to bring in uh, another subject matter expert uh, to help with that? And then, you know, there's a number of other good questions that um, in, 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 in planning and identifying your goals that I think are helpful um, or a number of good points, I should say, not questions, but a number of good points that I would say are helpful as sort of guideposts for as you're asking these questions, um, like those on the slide, and as you're developing what your coalition's plan is. Um, first, um, you know, we have a number of, um, of representatives from departments of education on the call recognize the incredibly important role that your state department of education uh, and your, your state education chief, your commissioner or superintendent of education, Recognize the incredibly important role they're going to play. Uh, you really need to be um, uh, working with them closely uh, and get to understand their thinking here because they are going to be the most influential um, uh, individuals and in, in, in organizations in this process. Second, the school districts really matter here. Um, uh, bring district leaders into the conversation now uh, and start getting their buy-in on things like turnaround and, and uh, potential ways to spend federal funding, pilot programs, things of that nature. Get their buy-in now. Um, you know, something that we're working on here already in Florida is talking with some of the um, superintendents and school board members and getting their buy-in and their understanding now because uh, they're going to have sign-offs on, on, on a number of key programs here. Um, and, and then third, you know, while implementation is going to look different in every state, uh, another just important element here is keep learning from each other. Um, uh, keep keep uh, taking advantage of every opportunity you can to learn from each other. Uh, certainly, uh, no state is going to have the same starting point as another in terms of accountability, in terms of innovation, uh, and no state is going to have exactly the same goals as any other state. But um, but we're all affiliated with different associations, legislative associations. Uh, many of us are affiliated with the PI Network, the State Policy Network, 
Uh, others um, uh, have close ties with the Council for uh, Chief State School Officers. Many organizations, including um, foundations like ours, that give you the ability to constantly compare what you're doing uh, and learn from other states. So take advantage of all the information uh, that's out there and take advantage of the opportunity just to learn uh, from other states. Uh, and that kind of actually takes me to, to our, our last slide. Um, uh, you know, how can we help? Um, uh, Claire mentioned earlier uh, about uh, certain points in the implementation process and where uh, the states have the ability to influence that process. The truth of it is states can influence it um, all the time. And we're happy to help at any point in time uh, if you need, as we have with some states already, uh, in wanting to comment, whether formally comment or just uh, setting up meetings with the uh, U.S. Department of Education if that's something that uh, you need help with. Um, we're happy to help with that, or we're happy to even just help preparing you for that. Um, and there are a number of other ways that we can help. Obviously, uh, we have three more webinars planned uh, in May, um, but we're happy to also um, uh, make efforts like that very state-specific. We've worked with about uh, a dozen states already on very specific either technical questions uh, or briefings. Claire has already got, uh, done some briefings uh, in state. She spoke at a North Carolina State House Committee. So uh, we will export Claire to your state uh, so she can come and, and, talk to, uh, and, and talk to whomever you need, the legislators or state board members. Um, so we're happy to help in that regard. Uh, just let us know. Likewise, um, please let us know as we take a deeper dive. We kind of you know, dipped our feet in the water here today, but as we take a deeper dive in these next three webinars, if there's something that you uh, really want to explore more in terms of the, the policy arena or strategy, let us know. And we'll, we'll work that into the PowerPoint. Um, and, and with that, um, unless there's any other questions, uh, thank you just so much for joining us today. We're grateful to have, I think, uh, folks from a, about 40 years to stay off. Uh, we really look forward to talking to everybody again. Um, Claire, I'll turn it back to you uh, and Sam if there's any other questions. And no other questions. No other questions, but uh, feel free to, to send them along or reach out specifically uh, to your Excel and Ed contacts. This is this is what we do. We, we are we truly are here to help, um, and this is a real challenge and opportunity for states. So thank you, thank you so much for joining us. You don't need to do anything because in your inbox will come an invitation to next week. Uh, webinar when we'll, we'll dig into um, what's actually in this law in terms of standards and assessments. We f feel it's worthy, I should say, we're trying to make these as bite-sized as possible so we can really dig in and, 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 and get the real state perspective on, on what means what it means for you. So next week will be standards and assessments. I'm happy to take that in whatever direction you want depending on your, on your questions. Um, thank you so much for joining us and uh, enjoy the rest of your week.